Hello and welcome to Huntington University's Intro to Philosophy class for the summer of 2017. Um, today's video lecture is going to be on Plato's Allegory of the Cave. It's a very short reading that you had to do, and so this will be a pretty short video, although we could spend uh, a significant amount of time talking about the details of the allegory. There's a lot going on. Uh, I'll try to give you some of the highlights, some of the things that will be relevant for our class. As you listen to the video lectures, uh, you need to take notes. I'll try to highlight various places where you definitely want to take notes that are pretty much verbatim. Um, I'll repeat things uh, and try to give those kinds of signals to you so that you know exactly uh, where you need to be taking notes and where you might need to pause and rewind. Uh, the allegory is a section of Plato's perhaps most famous work called uh, The Republic. And The Republic is a work of philosophy that is often included in like political science courses um, because it does have some relevance for structuring a kind of ideal society, and Plato's talking about that a little bit there, though I think most Plato scholars think that the real aim of the Republic is more about the individual and how the individual can uh, really achieve happiness, and Plato in that book argues that the only way to achieve genuine, deep, real, lasting happiness is by becoming wise. Uh, by becoming a, a good human. And so the allegory of the cave is a little bit about that. It's a little bit about how to become a good human. So think about some of the things going on in the allegory. We've got prisoners who are chained up. Uh, they, can, they can't look to the right nor to the left, and they've been chained like that their entire lives. Uh, you know, if you need to add some details to make this plausible, go ahead. They've been given food and water, say, intravenously. Um, uh, they're staring at a wall, uh, and on the wall there are shadows, and those shadows are the only things that these prisoners have really observed, and, and uh, there are noises that they've associated or correlated with the shadows, and oftentimes the shadows, one type of shadow is followed by another type of shadow, and oftentimes, that correlation between this type of shadow and this other type of shadow um, is fairly constant and repetitive. And so the prisoners uh, can sort of make predictions. This type of shadow will be followed by this other type of shadow, and so on and so forth. But the prisoner's world is made up of shadows. That's all they've been staring at. At some point, a prisoner escapes uh, the chains breaks free from the chains and begins to ascend uh, out of the cave. So the cave is sort of deep inside. It's 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 um, buried, you know, low, uh, uh, you know, below the ground. And so this prisoner, this freed prisoner, starts to escape out of the cave. The prisoner, uh, as, as he or she is, is ascending out of the cave, notices that there's this flat area behind them. At this flat area, there's this sort of low wall, and there's a large fire. And it turns out it's that fire that has been casting the shadow or, or providing the light for shadows to be cast on the wall that, that, that the prisoners have been facing. And the prisoner, the freed prisoner, notices persons walking back and forth in front of this fire, holding various, like, uh, statues or something. Puppets, I think, might be the translation that you read. Um, but they're really, like, holding statues as they walk back and forth. Statues of dogs and of trees and of uh, and maybe moons and... Um, people and whatever, you know, a statue of anything you can imagine. They're carrying it back and forth. And so this prisoner puts two and two together and realizes that the shadows that he or she's been staring at uh, their entire life on that wall 
are really just sort of images of these statues. And so you can imagine the prisoner coming to that realization and maybe, maybe the prisoner spends a decent amount of time staring at these statues moving back and forth and is mesmerized by them and thinks, holy cow, my whole life I've been staring at images of these and yet these are the real thing. Well, this prisoner looks up at some point and notices that the trail that he's on sort of continues to ascend out of the cliff, notices maybe a little bit of light uh, coming further on up the, the trail. And so this prisoner begins to ascend even more. And finally, the prisoner reaches the mouth of the cave, exits, and comes to see the outside of the cave for the very first time and notices that the statues which were being which you know whose shadows were being cast on that wall and were illuminated by the fire those statues actually now turn out to be images of actual trees and actual dogs and cats and giraffes and you know rocks and so on and so forth and then the prisoner outside the cave realizes that the fire which maybe that prisoner thought was like the main source of light for the world the prisoner now realizes that there's this other larger source of light the sun and so this prisoner now realizes that inside the cave their understanding of reality was extremely limited they've exited the cave and there's even a further ascent that the prisoner uh, really needs to make, according to Plato, and this ascent is realizing that even outside of the cave, surrounded by the stuff that the statues were representations of, the, the sort of real dogs and cats and trees and rocks and streams and people, uh, Plato wants to argue that there's another ascent that the prisoner can make, and that ascent is this, the prisoner can realize that the, the real trees and dogs and cats are actually themselves still images of something more real. And these are called uh, the forms. The forms are sort of the perfect representation, the perfect thing, the perfect cat, the perfect dog. Now, the form of a cat or the form of a dog actually won't be a cat or won't be a dog. It'll be something like the essence of a cat, the essence of a dog, the essence of a human that sort of thing. And so all humans will be sort of representations of that form. They'll be imperfect copies of the real perfect thing. And so the goal then is to continue the ascent out of the cave. And that last ascent from, you know, seeing real humans and real fans and real pillows rather than statues of pillows, statues of fans, or shadows of pillows, shadows of fans. That, that further ascent to realizing the essence of pillows, the essence of fans, the essence of humans, that's an ascent that doesn't require physical movement. That's an ascent that requires deep thought, uh, a desire to understand, a desire to gain wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so in the allegory, we have four stages. Stage one, this you definitely need to be paying attention to. Stage one, let's call that the shadow stage. Stage two, let's call that the statue stage. Stage three, let's call that the, re the object stage. Uh, stage four, we'll call that the form stage. Four stages, statue stage, I'm sorry, shadow stage, statue stage, object stage, form stage. Those stages represent different levels that you and I can be at in our own personal lives. Different levels of understanding, different levels of education and wisdom. And so Plato and Socrates, who's represented in the, in the allegory, really believed that most of us probably spend our entire lives at the shadow stage. We're concerned with superficial things. We're concerned with surfacey things. We're concerned with representations of representations of representations, and then we just want to go about our business. We want to make some money. We want to have a comfortable life. 
We want to uh, be, you know, we, we, most of our day is living in distractions from things that Plato, Socrates, and others think are much more important. Christ, Paul, Augustine, Aquinas, they would all agree with this sort of sentiment that most of us live our lives ignoring, living at a surface level, and living like prisoners in a cave staring at shadows. So one question to draw from this allegory is, what stage do you think you are at? And you might be at one stage in one area and a different stage in a different area. Maybe some of you are really good at math, and so your understanding of mathematics is at stage two or stage three. Uh, but one way to test this is to ask questions like this. What, is, what do you think goodness is? What do you think knowledge is? What do you think wisdom is? Uh, tell me what justice is. What do you think love is? Think about these ideas. Think about these, these features of the world, right? There's goodness in the world. There's love. There's justice. There's knowledge. Uh, and many of us think that these are some of the most important things that there are, that... that uh, you know, think about the Proverbs, right? The book of Proverbs says that, you know, go hunting after wisdom and understanding and goodness and justice, right? Seek these things harder than you seek anything else. They're much more valuable than gold and silver and precious stones, right? And many of us pay lip service to that and we say, yes, yes, that's very, very important. Well, how much time do you spend? How much time do I spend meditating on those things, seeking after those things with all of your heart? with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength? Do you seek after those things? Do you understand what they are? What is love? Could you tell me or tell someone, uh, you know, a friend or a family member, could you tell them what love is? Could you explain the nature of love to someone? And so we, we think these are important, yet Plato and Socrates are dismayed by the fact that the people who say these things are super important can't even articulate what they are. And so that's a good sign that if you don't know what love is, the chance of you actually displaying the genuine deep thing in your life, if you don't know what goodness is or wisdom is, the chance of you displaying that in your real life is going to be very low. And if you do happen to, dis to display it, it's probably going to be by accident. Uh... So the cave is, it's an allegory for us, right? It's a story about us and where we are. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you're at the statue stage. Now remember, here's something interesting. The shadows are images of statues, but the statues are also images. They're images of the sort of objects outside the cave, but it turns out that the objects outside the cave, according to Plato and Socrates, are themselves images. So shadows on this model are images of images of images. And you don't get to the real thing until you discover the nature, the essence, the sort of paradigm of what a thing is. What is a human being? What is love? What is goodness? What is beauty? What is truth? What is holiness? What are those things? Uh, and so Plato and Socrates want to convince us that these are things that we need to be achieving. These are things we need to be striving for on a daily basis. Some other lessons to be learned here are this. Um, education is really one of the major themes here. And the idea is that to be a truly educated person, you have to get out of the cave. And again, most even educated people, people with PhDs, are not necessarily truly educated. They may still be in the cave. And so, think of some of the lessons here. Education is going to be painful. That pr prisoner who gets free, he's in prison. Right? And he has to free himself from these chains. And those chains are metaphors too, right? Those are chains of our own making. We have put ourselves into chains through our addiction to the internet, our phone, uh, you know, various types of distractions enslave us. They, they, they imprison us, and we never end up seeing the real thing, the real beauty, real love, real goodness. We never get to really experience. 
And it's going to be a painful process, right? The, the process of leaving the cave is extremely painful. The prisoner's eyes have to adjust to the, to the light of the fire, then the light of the sun, and it's extremely painful and hard. And then the prisoner goes back into the cave, right? The prisoner gets to this awareness like, oh my gosh, we've been living our lives in a cave. We've been living our lives in deep ignorance and living on the staring at shadows our whole lives. And so the prisoner goes back in and wants to convert the former prisoners and say, come with me, come with me. I've discovered something beautiful and true and good. Uh, let's leave the cave. I'll show you the way out. And his fellow prisoners mock him and scoff at him. And ultimately, Plato thinks they would kill him. Now, that's exactly what happened to Socrates. Socrates went around Athens and asked people who said they understood things like goodness and piety and justice and virtue and holiness and love and asked them, please explain them. And when they tried to explain them, they couldn't. And Socrates pointing out their ignorance really ticked them off. And ultimately, Socrates was killed for being an annoyance. Um, and so this is likely to happen, right? If you want to meditate on and think about regularly all the time these very deep issues, you're going to annoy the crap out of people. Uh, you're going to annoy your family members and your friends. People are just going to say, you know, hey, let's eat, drink, and be merry. And uh, it's going to be frustrating to a lot of people, and it's going to be frustrating to you too. You're going to annoy yourself as well. Uh, but there is, you know, deep reality awaits you, right? Exiting the darkness of the cave and entering into the lightness of wisdom and beauty and real joy and peace and justice awaits you if you would only make the ascent. So education is a major theme here. Education is painful. Education requires conversion. It requires a turning around. Right? Real education requires a kind of turning towards the truth, a reorientation of your life towards things that matter. You can get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD, and it does not mean you are educated. Uh, think about it like this, those of you who are Christian who are watching this, Satan knows more than you and I do about, just, about pretty much everything at some level. And yet Satan would, is not really educated. He doesn't have that kind of deep wisdom, deep understanding of fundamental reality. And for Christians, of course, fundamental reality is the Trinity. Uh, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. And so, uh, though Satan is, would be deeply educated in sort of our contemporary terms, Satan is stupid. Satan is not wise. He is a fool. Uh, so you can get all these degrees and still not be educated. And you can fail to have these degrees and be deeply educated. It requires a turning, a reorienting of your life towards the things that matter. So one thing, we got education, and education is going to be painful. It's going to require a kind of conversion, a turning towards the things that matter. And then we get another interesting theme here. Uh, a kind of theme of sin, a, a theme of evil or wickedness, and that, and in the Plato, in Platonic scheme, and I think this is also mirrored in the Bible. Evil and wickedness look something like this: it's it's taking things that are lower goods and making them into higher goods. So think about those four stages again. Think about those four stages. You've got the shadow stage. It's the least real of all the stages. The statue stage. It's more real than the, stat than the shadow stage, but less real than the object and form stage. The object stage. It's more real than the statue and shadow stage, and less real, though, than the form stage. And then the form stage, it's the most real, right? It's the most real stage. Evil... Badness, sin, can be described on this model, and again, I think the Christian tradition largely agrees with this idea, as taking the least real, the least important, the least good, and moving it to higher levels of reality and higher levels of real. What's most important in your life? What do you spend your day doing? What do I spend my day doing? Is my phone, which is really a great great example of the shadow on the wall, right? Is my phone, do I spend more time on it, more time doing things that 
At the end of the day, I'm just twiddling my thumbs, wasting hours and hours, years of my life um, uh, on these really trivial and unimportant matters. So wickedness, evil, is treating less real, less good, less important things as though they are more real, more good, more important than they really are. It's this sort of uh, disordered loves, disordered uh, desires that you might have. So lots of fascinating themes here. And my hope is that for the rest of this uh, term, for the rest of this summer course, we're going to get into a deeper understanding of just one small part of philosophy. And the small part of philosophy we're going to focus on is ethics. And so our next reading in the next video lecture will be uh, an introduction to ethics, which is uh, ethics and morality I'm going to use interchangeably. So the idea we're going to think about what is goodness, what is badness, what is rightness, what is wrongness, how should I live, what type of person should I be, and we're going to try to think a little bit more deeply about those things uh, during this course. Uh, I hope you're able to follow the lecture and that it was meaningful to you and that you're excited about the class.